Welcome home. This is Audio XP for the 24th of August 2019. And the title of this episode is It's Never Pirate Treasure. As a kid, I always thought people misunderstood pirate treasure. It annoyed me that the so-called heroes would dig it up and claim the gold as theirs. It wasn't theirs. That gold belonged to other people. That was stolen treasure. I thought Robin Hood had it better. He would steal and then return the treasure. Okay, Robin Hood took from one set of people and then redistributed the money in a way that would ensure he would never get a visa to enter the States, but I was young and wasn't paying too much attention to the details. We're talking about piracy because one of the most popular stories on Geek Native this week has been about the pirate DM Clockwork. This guy was handing out bounties to encourage people to contribute pirated RPG content into a big old drop box full of loot, and then he was running a patron to sell access to the archive. Amazingly, he thought this was okay. Nearly a hundred people thought so too, or didn't care, because that's how many patron supporters he had. When Twitter noticed there was an outcry, now don't take that for granted. All over the internet you will find gamers who don't mind a bit of piracy. They see it either as a victimless crime or a justifiable one. That's a shame. In this case though, there was an outcry, and it looked as if Patron suspended his account, Wizards of the Coast sent over legal notices. On Friday though, the Patron was back up, minus the archive. That's a weird decision from Patron. DM Clockwork's patron now says he'll create homebrew content. Well, we'll see. He also insists he wants to do this library thing for real. Well, we'll see. If you want legit access to helpful free material, then I recommend Raging Swan Press. You will find loads of stuff there. If you don't mind paying a dollar into a patron account to supercharge your access to a treasure trove of gaming material, then I recommend Raging Swan Press. Raging Swan Press is the publisher in Geek Native's RPG Publisher Spotlight this month. It's a great story of one guy who decided to go full-time in gaming and who made it work. Want to earn above market rates for writing RPG material? Get yourself onto the roster of trusted freelancers that Raging Swan Press sometimes work for. It's Geek Native's own patrons who voted for Raging Swan Press. Each month I pick a publisher to highlight and that process is something that patrons can guide. It's a perk. One of the other perks the site offers is that sometimes patrons get freebies. This month any loyal patron or anyone who signs up before the end of the month will get a pair of little monster models in the post. Collecting monsters is one thing, trying to kill them is the more usual approach in RPGs. This week on Geek Native, I wrote up 16 common tips that experienced GMs offer when they're asked about narrating combat. As you can imagine, Matt Mercer features. See what Matt, Matt, Matt Mercer does and copy him is definitely one strong tip. Two other ones that I particularly liked are um, having your power attacks triggered by descriptions. So in this model, players have little cheat sheets which have a few lines of description for each power attack that they have. You know, and a power attack could be a feat, or a special move, or an ability, something like that. And whenever the player says one of the matching descriptions for the power attack, that's what triggers the power attack. So the idea here is you're helping the players narrate more and contribute more than just, I use feat 5, something like that. Um, another idea is the opposite, where the, you, as the GM, you have a set of pre-prepared lines that you can read out. Now, these are the lines that you will read out when it's it's boring, mundane combat, not something that requires you to step up and narrate extra special. This is your, your default go-to, the baseline, so mundane combat is still descriptive. There are a dozen other examples on the site if you're tempted to take a look. And if you like any of those suggestions, then Wizards of the Coast are working on a newly expanded Eberron, where you might get to test them. I think that's the biggest official news from the industry this week, and it's a bit of a strange one. Once again, Amazon kind of stole the spotlight. Gamers spotted 
Eberron Rising from the Last War as a pre-order before Wizards of the Coast could announce it. I quite like the cover. It has a war force up front, a white-haired elf with a strange bat-like familiar on her shoulder. But plenty of gamers have expressed their dislike for it. So much so that um, Wizards are kind of distancing themselves from it. Jeremy Crawford went as far to say it was just a holding image, some interior art that they were using as a temporary cover. That comment really wasn't backed up when Greg Tito talked about the Eberron book in D&D News. He explained that Wizards liked it, but were listening to the feedback they were getting. Now, the cover situation is complicated because this main cover is actually only one of two covers that you could end up with. If you go into your local gaming store you might be able to find a copy of the book with an exclusive sort of luxury cover that looks fantastic that's a cover of a dirigible a steampunk airship uh, all brass and and arcs floating across the Eberron background shooting from the hip here I think it's probably too late in the day for wizards to change a hardback cover surely they've begun the process of production well I guess we'll find out as a reminder, Geek Native runs a column called Routinely Itemized that comes out every Friday. It's up to number 10. In Routinely Itemized, you will find a bullet point list of all the RPG news I found this week. Well, most of it. So that's the place to look if you don't want to miss any RPG stories. Audio XP, this podcast differs because it's a highlight show, and we don't just talk about RPGs. For example... I want to quickly chat about She-Hulk, Moon Knight, and Miss Marvel. What do they have in common other than being Marvel heroes? Well, they're all coming to Disney+. Plus. So we've got Miss Marvel, who is a Pakistani-American uh, character, uh, a young teen. And when I think about Miss Marvel, I think about conversations I've had about diversity in comics at work. I have a programmer in front of me who is all for diversity, but he maintains the storylines with Marvel's new range of heroes have been rubbish, and that's what's put people off. I think this is an opportunity to tell a good story with the new Miss Marvel, and that could create a whole new generation of fans. So I'm really keen that Marvel get this right. Now, I know fans are really interested in Moon Knight. That's not a character I know too much about, except I know the storylines tend to have a much darker tone. Moon Knight seems to be one of four different personalities that inhabit a person brought back from the dead by an Egyptian god of vengeance. So yeah, okay, I can see how that could get quite dark. And then She-Hulk is a character I know much better. And I think the important thing with uh, She-Hulk is that this will be an easier character to tell stories with than the Hulk. Because she's she's smarter, so she's you know it's easier to have a sort of an emotional engagement in there, and she's not as strong, so she hopefully won't be as sort of invulnerable as a Hulk can be, open to more nuanced stories. None of this will matter to me, of course, if Disney Plus doesn't actually launch in the UK, and there's worrying signs because they've announced some international dates, and the UK wasn't on that list. Okay, it's probably a rubbish time to launch in the UK, given Brexit might happen and international agreements might be up in the air. Disney have said that they want Disney Plus to get to every major market within two years. So hopefully the UK is considered a major market and hopefully we get Disney Plus by 2021. Oh, it's going to be a long wait if that's the case. Another quirky but not gaming story is the auction of the Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch. That name might mean nothing to you, especially since it's a prop from a movie that's nearly 45 years old. But if you are a Monty Python fan though, then take heart from the fact that the Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch might fetch as much as £100,000 at auction. Now if you want to nose around the details, there's a link on Geek Native. Lastly, since we started on gamers getting it wrong and getting messed up in piracy, I wanted to end in a story of gamers getting it right. There are two fundraisers right now that will make your heart sing. Gamers have been super generous. The first is for the gaming icon that is Rick Loomis. Now he's a chap behind Flying Buffalo, a president of Gamma, who's been you know coordinating play by a male game since the 70s. 
he he's in hospital. He has a bills to pay. He has a family to care for, and it's a struggle. So there is a fundraiser to try and raise thirty eight thousand dollars. That's a huge amount of money. But amazingly, at the time that this podcast has been recorded, there's we're nearly there. There's thirty five thousand dollars raised. You know, this is a, a a proper GoFundMe where every dollar that you can find will make a difference. And the same is true for the fundraiser that Sarah Newton is having to run. I mean, it's terrible, but Sarah's not been able to work for the last five months, as she's been taking care of her husband. And now, unfortunately, she has funeral fees to pay. But with the generosity of the industry, we might help Sarah cope financially with the loss of the brown dirt cowboy and maybe get my drama press back on its feet. Now, both those campaigns are doing quite well, and it's really great to see just how generous gamers can be. This is a great community. And on that note, I hope to see you next week.